Hello, hello. Maya Daniels here, um, speaking to you, as you can tell, uh, straight from the north, the rebel country of Sweden in Corona times, who knew that we were going to be ever considered rebels, um, but here we are. Um, I've been asked to uh, log on today and talk to you a little bit about um, my recently published book uh, called Elf Dahlia. The initial inspiration to Elf Dahlia, to the work, to, to this book, um, is the language Elf Dahlian, which is spoken in this community. And it's also the, the, the language of uh, my grandparents. And the mystery that is actually surrounding this language, um, it's, it's, it is a mystery to linguists and historians how this language has managed to survive. Um, it is the closest you get to Old Norse. And so essentially that means it's the closest you get to whatever the Vikings used to speak um, once upon a time. And people tend to assume that um, it's Icelandic that is the closest you get to Old Norse today, which is, and they also have managed to, Icelandic is very well preserved as well. Um, and it was preserved because it was an island far away from most things. Uh, where, whereas Elvdalen is a small community in the semi-north of the central north of Sweden and it's a community that has never been isolated. In fact, quite the opposite. They, um, they were quite active tradesmen because they had poor soil and it was a poor community so they had to go out and, and encounter the rest of the world if you, if you like. So the fact that they've managed to preserve this language is not quite um, normal. So there is a perplexing element to that. So um, that mystery is something that I um, have always been drawn to. And also the fact that my, um, I don't understand the language or I don't speak the language. I guess maybe I do understand it, but um, when I was a child, my grandparents would speak Eldalian when I wasn't supposed to understand what they were saying. So there's always been that personal sort of mystery or, or intrigue in terms of like the, that, what the language is doing and, and when it was used. Um, so um, also I think um, starting off uh, thinking photographically or thinking in images um, in relation to something that is quite abstract as a language is I think um, was a very sort of fruitful um, starting point for me and then I ended up found, finding this archive from a man who lived in Elfdalen a uh, hundred years ago his name is Tim Lars Persson and um, his images are um, I mean incredible I, to me they are of course they are um, um, they are very close to me I, and I think when I found them it was a, a straight connection uh, for me to his work um, he he was a he was a he was a sort of a, a scientist you could argue, and also like a local photographer. Um, he brought electricity to Elf Dalen, but he was a big thinker, and I, to, I tend to think of him as a wizard. Um, and he was interested in natural magic. I mean, it was before it was at a time early to, um, early 1900s, whereby the the ideas of science and the idea of the occult magic hadn't they hadn't been separated yet. So he had a much more inclusive way of thinking of mystery and of magic and of science, um, which also inspires me a lot when thinking about the world today, because essentially I am in this book using um, nature in many ways to speak about cultural phenomena, And in a way I'm doing that as an, an attempt also to try and bridge this gap between culture or you know man and nature or you know the nature culture divide however you like to think of that um it's something that i i don't necessarily believe is very fruitful but it is such an important part of western uh, thought um so going back to ten lars's work and his ideas uh, allowed me as well to to to, to imagine in, in a different way and to engage with uh, this language or the ideas that I had in my head and with his archive. So the book is constructed as a dialogue between myself 
and ten Lars. And so you have a few images of mine, spurts of images of mine that then are responded or like in, in, in conversation with a few images of his. So I'm obviously appropriating his work um, for the story that I am um, intending to tell. Um, and the moon is used within this work as a as a sort of um, it has a, it plays a role in the sequencing of, of the book. Um, it reoccurs and it's sort of also trying to enhance this idea of the cyclical uh, of the cycle that you know um, is living within the specific narration. Even though the narration is quite loose, there is still something that drives. Uh, that a narrative within the book. Um, and so I'm using the moon as a way also to, to, to go back both to the idea of, of this idea of magic or, 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 or the unknown, but also to science uh, and to the idea of like this 24 hour cycle, the way that the moon influences everything on earth, everything that is alive, living. So, I mean, for me, most of the favorite images in the book are Tim Lars's uh, images, the archive images, partly because it's easier for me to really like them because they're not made by me. All of the color images are made by me, uh, but it's also because I'm absolutely inf infatuated with, with this man's work. And that's why I'm having a hard time sort of letting go of, of, of this work. I think the local heritage foundation that he was, um, that he started, that he helped start it, uh, starting up in, in, um, in the early 1900s, they have about 5,000 glass plates of his work. And the book Elf Dahlia only contains about 30 images of his. So it's a very vast um, archive and it has potential to become um, much, much more than just this one book. I think uh, there are some, uh, let's see if I can find one from this dummy. There are some images that are, are more honing in on, on, on nature in this book, uh, but it's, they are also um, in a way reflecting the idea of the photographic process as I've been uh, working with light leaks. And so basically allowing for uh, the randomness and also allowing for um, actually the elements nature itself to enter into the image making process with me and so by allowing for these light leaks and allowing for time to affect the image and really slow exposures or even the wind um, in the way that they, it affects how um, the light is distributed in the image has been an important way for me to also uh, think of uh, the photographic doc document and the process and to sort of allow for the viewer to, to, to think again and to look again and to question what they're actually seeing. So it's not just a, a simple show and tell, it's more complex than that. And it's to think about what, what, and what are we seeing at this very moment and how, and how am I being potentially, well, manipulated or how am I being led to believe uh, in what I see. So it's this image potentially um, where I have allowed a light leak to seep into the image and affect the colors, which makes for a, a strike, quite strange um, atmosphere in the image. In this image, um, from the way that the light leak is imprinted on the negative, you can actually see uh, Kodak and the number of the frame written on the, on the image. So whilst you're sort of looking trying to figure out assessing what you're looking at um you're also then informed by the fact that this is um a photograph this is a construction of something and that um i'm i was keen to to sort of find a way to include that in into my process i haven't just dealt with history in the sense that i'm including the archive imagery because the archives I'm not necessarily intending for anyone to read as of a particular time or of a particular time. I'm trying to actually go against this idea of, of um, now and then within the work. I'm trying to create this other um, sphere or time scope. 
uh, or timelessness potentially in, 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 in the work. But what I have been doing is I've been using the, the local history of Elfdal and as a very key um, way of, of, of working, particularly the, the moment in time, early uh, or mid 1600s, uh, where Elfdalen was the birthplace uh, or an event in Elfdalen ignited the, the Swedish witch hunts. Um, so it was a young girl, 12 year old girl, who was accused of having walked on water. And that was sort of the, 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 the moment that, that kind of caused uh, a major uh, historical event in Sweden. And it's uh, an event that hasn't been like, nothing similar has happened since. It was a hor horrific uh, moment in time. And, and it started with 20 women uh, and one man being executed in Eldon and on the accusation of, of witchcrafts. Uh, and now for me, um, more than anything, I think it's the idea of, of, of the, the role of Eldon within this moment in history and the creation of um, the, the notion of the witch, which is in, in no way innocent. And I don't necessarily believe, I don't believe in, in, in the fact that which they, these people were witches, but it's rather the idea of center and periphery and state oppression and resistance that comes across for me in, in, in the recording or in the documentation of this event. And for me, um, there is a resistance. There is a, a clear resistance in Elfdalen uh, to um, sort of authorities in the way that they've managed to preserve the language, in the way that the, the witch hunts happened, began in this place in Sweden. Clearly there is a sense of resistance. And, um, and I see that also in, in, in today um, in Elton, and I see that in my grandparents who I admire a lot for it. And, and um, it is really this idea that um, we, we, we won't necessarily uh, comply and that feeling I have tried to bring in into the book and also of course in the sense that I'm engaging with something that is spoken in in a medium that is mute so there is a resistance even if there is a compliance in a sense to, to speak about the language the language is never heard and that is important to me in the sense that um, there is this element of, of, of rejection or, or of saying no or of resisting to give oneself away completely, um, both within the work, but also within this idea of, of what, what photography does best. It is the preservation of the mystery in a sense that makes something um, more interesting or stronger or more powerful. Um, so I've, I've, I've really um, have had that in mind um, a lot when making the work and also when thinking of of the, of of this worldview because essentially the language for me becomes a worldview it becomes something much more than just the spoken word so when engaging with with these thoughts the idea of resistance is is is, is key and i think that you can feel that when you when you open the book when you start flicking through the work and through the pages I hope that there is a sense of resistance. It's it's a book that kind of slowly gives its itself away. It's not going to give itself away in the first sort of few pages. It will gradually get there, and that um, that also comes from this uh, engagement with the local history and the whole historical events that are associated to this place. I like. Um, to involve other people in my creative process. I have a hard time um, doing it all by myself, um, whether it's engaging with this archive and how, I, how that allowed me to, to really, um, uh, I think it wasn't until I found this archive that I realized that it was a possible uh, project to make, this idea of, of also, the content and the form finding its way to, to, to join together in the way that I want to speak about of notions of language and how language is more than just the spoken word, how it is also reflected in, in the sense of a worldview. Um, 
and how can I then create this worldview in images? Part of that, part of what became important in that creation was this sense of a dialogue or this sense of conversation um, with this archive, with this man who lived in Elton in a hundred years prior to, to me. Um, so this idea of, of conversation, it, it can be found anywhere in my work, I think, even in the in video installation uh, that I made for the exhibition, I um, invited a sound artist it's called Jonathan Maurice, who contacted me out of the blue. And he um, basically had made a playlist of amazing sounds inspired by this image of the two boys sitting on the car with the, with the smoke. So he just emailed me to ask me if, if he could use that image on his SoundCloud for to, you know for the playlist because it had been such a huge inspiration and I listened to the sounds and I, I, I immediately um, proposed a, you know a collaboration so it, in a way it was just brought from, from from the universe our collaboration which is also a reason for me to really which made me really want to do the, the installation piece so we're going to show a part of that um, now. That's enough, I think, for me um, from the north. Um, I hope you're all uh, safe um, in this strange time. I am, um, yeah, I wish you all the best. Um, see you later. <laughs>